All right, good morning, class. What I want to do is just quickly go over the things we talked about on yesterday in terms of what are the key characteristics of the eukaryotic organisms we care about in microbiology, including we talked about uh, algae, we talked about fungi, and we also talked about protozoans. Now, we start off the protozoans first. In other words, protozoans, what do you have to know? A, they're all unicellular. Okay. B, they lack cell walls. There's only one of them, okay? I'll mention one protozoan has a cell wall. It's the dinoflagellate. Remember, the dinoflagellate used to be an alga. It causes red tide, by the way. It used to be an alga, right? Because it has chlorophyll. That is one of the photosynthetic protozoans that used to be categorized as an alga, but because of its molecular uh, DNA and RNA, they put it with the protozoans. Now, that is the only one that has a cell wall. The other ones, including euglena, okay, euglena is also photosynthetic, it has chlorophyll. Euglena does not have a cell wall. So all the protozoans, with the exception of the nanoflagellate, they lack cell walls. Now, most of them are chemoheterotrophic, except for the ones I just named, right? Euglena and nanoflagellates, they're photosynthetic. And remember, they used to be algae. Now, most protozoans reproduce asexually, if they reproduce sexually, they do it by uh, conjugation. So it's not like the bacteria conjugation. There are no sex pili. The two protozoan species would just kind of line up together side by side, kind of like what humans would do, for example, and then they just exchange their DNA. Now, with the fungi, okay, they have cell walls. Oh. And in their cell walls, when they you network, say, yes. yeah, when you say um, exchange DNA, so it's just DNA exchange, nothing. Exactly, they're exchanging DNA. Okay. And usually, when the protozoans are doing conjugation, they're using their micronucleus to do it. So some protozoans have two nuclei: a macronucleus and a micronucleus. So if they're doing sexual reproduction via conjugation, primarily they're using their micronucleus. They would use their macronucleus to do asexual reproduction. Okay. Now, with the fungi, they have cell walls, and in their cell walls, they have chitin. Remember, chitin is basically that ex the um, polysaccharide found in the exoskeletons ex of, of insects. Also, all fungi are chemoheterotrophic. All of them are, so they have to go out and look for their food. They lack chlorophyll, so they cannot do photosynthesis. Now remember, I am going to hold you accountable to the fungal classifications and know how they are put into the categories. Remember, we had the zygomycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. It's all based on how they reproduce sexually. So the zygomycota, they make zygospores, right, when they do sexual production. Ascomycota, ascospores, basidiomycota, basidiospores. Now, there is one group of fungi that, as of right now, we don't know how they do sexual reproduction, and they are the deuteromycetes. So that's deuteromycetes. Our example was candida albicans. That's basically the yeast that causes yeast infection and thrush if it's in the mouth. Now, we're just getting into the algae. We started the algae on yesterday. What do you need to know about algae? Okay. I'll get into the morphology after the slide, but primarily, okay, they are all photosynthetic because they all have pigments, okay? They have chlorophyll or different pigments used for photosynthesis. I mentioned yesterday that how we place all algae into categories is based on what pigment they have. So I showed you that chart yesterday. Basically, you have red algae, green algae. The golden algae is based on what colors they have for the sole purpose of photosynthesis. Okay, algae have cell walls just like plants do. And most algae, as I said earlier on yesterday, most algae are aquatic. Remember, I said most because some algae are terrestrial. Now, let's get into the morphology of algae. Now, I said that protozoans are unicellular. They all are. When we talk about the fungi, some are unicellular, like the yeast, but others, like molds, mushrooms, okay, they're multicellular. But with the algae, they can come in different forms. Some algae are unicellular. Some algae are colonial. Now, if they are colonial, like bulbox, for example, bulbox is a type of green algae because it's what green. Do you see all the bulbox colonies inside of this uh, uh, sphere here? These are individual bulbox colonies, and 
and they can live on their own. They can go out of the sphere and go on their own way, but they are colonials. So these are unicellular allies. So each one is unicellular, but they live together as a colony, and each one can break off and go on their own, or they can have simple multicellular structures, and if they do, we call that whole structure a phallus. Okay. Now, phalli is just more than one. <clears throat> If we take a look at this red album, because it looks red, it looks multicellular. In fact, it looks like a plant. Now, the reason why these multicellular algae are not plants, algae lack true tissues and they lack true organs, just like the fungi. Some fungi sort of look like plants, like mushrooms, for example, sort of, kind of, but just like with the mushrooms, which are fungi, just like with these multicellular algae, they lack true tissues, they lack true organs. In other words, they are multicellular. All these cells are the same. Because in your tissues, you have different kind of cells. And this alga, all these cells are exactly the same. Now in terms of how they reproduce, okay, algae have options. They can do sexual as well as asexual reproduction. Now with the unicellular algae, for example, if they're doing asexual reproduction, all they're doing is mitosis followed by cytokinesis. I said earlier on yesterday that mitosis is what? For asexual reproduction. Now, if they do sexual reproduction, they are going to make gametes. Now, if they make gametes, each individual cell will just be the gamete. So in other words, if you have a unicellular alga, it will be the gamete. It will find another unicellular alga, and when they fuse, right, they make your zygote. Now, usually with the algae, the adult form is usually haploid, which means when you make the diploid zygote as a result of sex reproduction, that zygote has to go through meiosis to what cut the chromosome number in half. Okay. Now, with multicellular algae, like that red algae on the previous slide, they can reproduce simply by fragmentation. Now, in fragmentation, a piece of this phallus will literally break off, and it will grow into a whole nother organism. So that's fragmentation. You see that with the multicellular algae. Now, the multicellular algae, they can also reproduce sexually with this term called alternation of generations. Now, it seems a bit confusing. What does this really mean, alternation of generations? That simply means that within that algal life cycle, they go through a haploid stage and a diploid stage. It's very similar to plants. Plants do the same thing. So in the plant life cycle, it goes through the haploid stage and then the diploid stage. Now, with these algae, the diploid stage would make the gametes. It would go through meiosis it would make the gametes. The gametes then will be the haploid stage. So in other words, within the algal life cycle with the multicellular algae, they go through a haploid stage and the diploid stage. The diploid stage will basically produce your gametes. Do we need to know what alternation of generation is? Or just mention that if we know about it? You should just understand the concept. I'm not going to hold you to that in terms of the test. Just understand that that's one way that multicellular algae can reproduce. But I won't hold you to that. So gametes are made in a haploid stage. Gametes are made in the diploid stage. In other words, the diploid stage will go through meiosis to make the gametes. Now, in terms of how algae are classified, it's not settled, but basically all the algae are placed into groups based on their pigments. And I showed you this table on yesterday because that's really the take home message I want you to get from that whole table. I'm not going to hold you to their phylum name. Okay, I could, but I'm not. Just know that their names primarily are based on their colors. Now, when you come down to these guys, like pyrophyta, pyrophagulates, now I'm really wondering why in the world they put some of these dinoflagellates into algae because they're in with the protozoans. Now, this is real quick. This is like if you get on that game show, for example. They're called pyrophyta, just like with strict pyogenes, pyromaniac means fire, red, okay? So, dinoflagellates causes red tide. In other words, when they overgrow in the ocean, the water looks red. That's why they're called pyrophyta. 
That's the reason why. They're not red in terms of their color, but when they overgrow, they cause red tide. Okay. And the euglenophytes, again, they don't belong here, right? Because remember, they got put in with the protozoan. So these two guys, right, they got X out of algae, and they got placed with the protozoans. And that's why I said some protozoans, these two guys are photosynthetic. And especially this guy, it has a cell wall. Okay. Now lastly, we'll talk about animals. So, so far we've been talking about primarily unicellular organisms, or if they were multicellular, they lack true tissues and they lack true organs. Now in this point, we are going to focus on animals. Now animals are what? Multicellular. They have true tissues and they have true organs and they are all chemoheterotrophic. Now, we'll briefly talk about the helminths, or basically parasitic worms. Now, most parasitic worms are macroscopic, meaning you can see them with your eye. But we care about them in microbiology because how we detect whether or not you have an infection caused by a parasitic worm is basically either the eggs that they make at your school or the larvae that come out of your school. So that's what we care about. That's how we diagnose the disease. Usually the worms stay in your intestine. Usually they don't come out. Sometimes they do. It's scary if they do. Usually they stay in your intestine. The only way we know you are, you're sick with the worm is basically look at your stool sample, look for eggs, or look for the larvae, the immature ones. Now, these arthropod vectors, these are animals that carry pathogens. We care about them a whole lot. Now, arthropod vectors, it basically means jointed leg, literally. So arthropod literally means jointed leg. So think about your arachnids, and think about your insects. They have jointed legs. And we care about some of them because they can carry diseases. Now, mechanical vectors, they simply carry the disease. So for example, you don't like when flies land on your food because you know flies carry diseases. In other words, flies carry bacteria. Where do they hang out? They hang out on feces, for example, dead organisms, and then they come land on your hamburger. And they're carrying whatever they got from the feces or that dead animal onto your hamburger. And in that case, that fly would be a mechanical vector because it's simply carrying pathogens. It's just carrying them around. Now, this is really different from a biological vector. Now, in the biological vector, the pathogen is actually living in that animal. It's living in the insect. It's living in the arachnid. In other words, that vector is a host for that pathogen. So think of malaria, okay? Think of the Anopheles mosquito. That Anopheles mosquito would be the biological vector for Plasmodium because Plasmodium actually lives within that mosquito. So that's a biological vector. Now, disease vectors belong in two classes of arthropod. Remember, arthropod is basically joint, jointed leg. You have your arachnids, and your insects. So I want you to know the difference between arachnids and insects because they all have jointed legs, but there are some differences. Yes, Mark? Oh, oh no, you don't. Okay. No worries, no worries. Okay, we'll deal with the arachnids first. Now, adult arachnids, 